Welcome. The webinar will begin momentarily. Please hold tight. Welcome to the InnoSight webinar, Unite Your Senior Team. We'll begin in a few moments. Everyone is gathering. Greetings and welcome once again to the InnoSight webinar, Unite Your Senior Team. I'm Evan Schwartz, Director of Storytelling here at InnoSight in Boston, and I'm pleased to introduce our presenters. Bernard Coomerly and Scott Anthony are authors of the new Harvard Business Review article, Unite Your Senior Team, How Swisscom's Leaders Aligned Around a Growth Strategy. Both Scott and Bernard are senior partners here at InnoSight, with Bernard based out of our Switzerland office and Scott based out of our offices in Singapore. We want to hear from you. To ask a question, please type and submit them through the Q&A box. I'll be collecting them and posing them to Scott and Bernard. We'll also be asking for your participation on poll questions throughout the presentation. For optimal viewing from your device, please go to your, your view options menu at the top and ensure your zoom ratio is set to fit to window. This webinar, as well as the presentation slides, will be recorded and shared with you following today's event. Now I will hand it over to Scott and Bernard. Thank you very much, Evan, and this is Scott who is talking first. I apologize to those on the webinar today. You can tell perhaps I've got a little bit of a cold, so my voice is a little bit scratchy but really looking forward to today's discussion where my colleague Bernard and I will share some of our latest thinking about this complicated topic about how you get a senior team to align in a direction in the face of strategic uncertainty. For those of you who don't know InnoSight, we are a growth strategy consultancy. Our purpose is to empower forward-thinking organizations to navigate disruptive change and own the future. So our specialty is helping large established organizations confront the challenges of disruptive change, to imagine a new future, and then work together to really make that happen. And what Bernard and I are gonna talk about today is one of the biggest challenges that we have observed in really making that happen, in allowing organizations to conceive of, to see, and to then go create that next version of themselves. Here we are, I'm on the right side of the page, as you heard from Evan in the beginning. I am based in our office out in Singapore. I've been based there since 2010. Bernard, do you wanna say hello to our webinar guests? Hello everybody, I'm Bernard Kummerle. I'm a senior partner in Europe and I'm based in Lausanne, Switzerland. All right, great, you heard from Evan that we're going to make this an interactive session as much as we can. That means beyond the Q&A, beyond the questions you wanna to throw to us, we are gonna ask you a couple of poll questions. So I want you to, to look at this cartoon here. This cartoon is done by the great Tom Fishburne. If you don't follow Tom Fishburne at marketunist.com, you absolutely should. He does a fantastic job of illustrating some of the foibles of business life today. So look at the cartoon. Your job is digital transformation, the leader says with emphasis. It's not just about disruptive technology. We need a whole new way of thinking across the entire organization. This is one of our absolute top priorities we're all counting on you, so good luck on this summer internship. Something's going on in this picture, something that we see at a lot of organizations. So our question to you, as you think about your own organization's transformation program, what do you think is the biggest issue? You don't perceive a need. You don't have a good answer to what you need to do. You don't have alignment about the path forward. You're struggling to find and allocate resources, or you're just not executing it well. Kristen, can you open up the poll and we see what our attendees have to say? I've just learned from our crack support team here, Lucas, that we're not allowed to cast our own vote. We were gonna go and bias the ballot box a little bit, but make sure you click on the submit button after you cast your vote and we'll see what you have to say. Thank you. 
Hey, just a few more seconds. And we'll be tabulating the results. All right, you've come to the right webinar. So the number one thing that you said is a misalignment about the path forward. You know, what's interesting is when you look at the, the cartoon here, it's very easy to say this is a resource allocation problem. So what, what's going on in this cartoon? Well, we just haven't allocated enough resources to digital transformation. It's silly. We're asking the summer intern to do it. But what we often find is the root cause in this case is a lack of alignment about the importance of an issue. Let me make it real. We were working with a large organization in Singapore, and this situation pretty much occurred. We were talking to the person who was in charge of digital transformation, and they said, I I'm going out of my mind. Every time we have a senior leadership meeting, we talk about digital transformation. We talk about how important it is. I ask people, how important is this issue? Everyone says one of the most important things we're working on. We all then leave the room. I then call up the individual function heads and I say, can you give me a resource to go and work on this? And everybody says, oh, no, 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 I don't have any resources to go work on this. What they say in the room and what happens out of the room are fundamentally different. The passive support in the room turns to active subversion outside the room. This is the challenge we see many organizations face. There are some really powerful statistics to show how deep, how persistent this problem is. One of the ones that we saw that we highlighted in the article came from an article in the Sloan Management Review that found that less than 50% of top level executives can't name their top three strategic priorities. Said another way, you ask them, what's the most important things you're working on? And the top leaders in the organization can't even name it. You go one level deeper in the organization, it's even worse. Only 20% of N minus one executives can name their top strategic priorities. Why does this happen? Well, there's actually a lot of very well-studied, well-known behavioral phenomena that are behind this. I'm sure many of you are familiar with at least some of the things on the page here, like groupthink or group thinking, where groups will tend to conform to something even if individuals disagree with it. You have the authority bias. When the most senior person in the room speaks, even if you privately disagree with it, you'll say, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. You've got the fundamental attribution error. Everything that conforms to our beliefs or everything that succeeds, we say is because of our excellence. Anything that goes against our beliefs, anything that doesn't work, we say that's just down to dumb, stupid luck. But one of my absolute favorite ones, social loafing. What this means is when we're in a group, individually we get lazy because we know if we disagree with something, we're gonna be asked to do something. This draws on very well-documented psychological research. If you're by yourself and you see somebody who's injured, like any good human being, you go to help them. If you're in a place like Boston or a place like Switzerland or a place like Singapore, Switzerland might be different. But if you're in Geneva or Zurich or Singapore or Boston or places like that, when you've got streams of people going down the road, there can be an, in, an individual that's in really bad shape that everybody just walks by. This is a really big challenge that makes it hard for us when we're in groups to truly align behind a path forward. And if we can't align, we can't allocate resources. If we can't allocate resources, we cannot go and create the next version of our organization. And this is absolutely critical. We're in a world where the pace of change continues to increase, where we can't execute tomorrow's business model using the same approach that we use today. We have to think differently. We have to act differently. We have to do fundamentally different things if we really are going to create the future. That means management has to break from the past. It has to embrace a new reality and go and make it happen. But this is an incredibly hard thing to do. So what I've tried to do here is to give you a little bit of an introduction to the problem. Fundamental challenge, leadership teams aren't aligned. Even when they think they are aligned, they suffer from what's known as the illusion of unanimity, where actually everyone thinks in different ways, which means they don't allocate their time and resources to make the new direction, to make the new decision happen. What we're going to start to do now is to talk about our answer. And we're going to do this in maybe a little bit different way than you've seen in other webinars. Bernard's going to provide a bit of an overview, and then we're going to start doing some doodles and some drawings to bring the specific techniques to life. So let me turn it over to Bernard to give the overview of the approach, and then the pens are going to start flying, and we'll see what happens. Bernard. Thank you so much, uh, Scott. Uh, indeed, uh, to uh, 
have overcome these hurdles, which you mentioned uh, for transformation, you need alignment. And over the last years, we have been working with top leaders of, of many organizations and have developed a methodology or approach uh, that is pretty robust. Uh, it's built on three pillars. The first pillar is really, first, you have to establish a common ground. And common ground includes that you need an innovation typology because business model innovation is not the same as sustaining innovation. And there are also other terms like radical innovation, breakthrough innovation, et cetera, et cetera. And you need a common language. A second thing which is also important is that you have a clear understanding what business you're in, uh, in what business boundaries you are designing uh, the strategy moving forward and so on. The second one is very important that you expose the misalignment. Sometimes people believe they are aligned, but they are not aligned. And you have to make clear and transparent that there is a misalignment in bringing everybody's voice uh, to the surface and really showing how big that misalignment is. Then once you know that you're misaligned, that you have created a sense of urgency, and then you have to find a way to align the leadership team. And our article, which we wrote, is really around those three themes, and that will also be the logic and sequence of the webinar uh, following now these different slides. Uh, uh, great, Bernard. Thank, thanks for the introduction. You know, we're going to, again, make this real by doing some doodles, and you're also going to draw on the experience that, that you had working with Swisscom, which the, the third author in the article was the head of strategy during the process that you walked them through. So where I think it would be a good place to start would be right with that language point. You know, Insight has talked forever about the importance of having a common language and innovation typology. How do you actually do that, though? It sounds nice, but can you bring it to life a little bit? Yeah. The first thing is when you talk with leadership, uh, you talk about transformation, then automatically the word innovation comes to the surface. And then you have a conversation around different types of innovation, and suddenly someone will say, oh, we have to be more disruptive. And then you really have to ask the entire group, what do you mean by disrupt disruption? What do you mean by disruptive innovation? And suddenly you will see that they do not have a common understanding. Same for business model innovation. It's the word everybody uses, but if you ask people, what do you mean by it? They're different understandings. So what you need before you talk about transformation is the types of innovation uh, you are, which are relevant for your organization. And there's not one answer fits all. There are organizations like Lego, they have nine types of innovation. Uh, P&G has three types and Nestle has four. What we do very often, we try to use the following logic. On the X axis, we put business models and you can have an existing business model or you can have a new one. And you can have on the y-axis, let's say, markets and customer segments existing or new. The way we define it very often as a starting point for our clients is to say, okay, if you all have an existing business model in an existing market and customer segment, that's the core. That's core innovation or sustaining innovation. You may also talk about efficiency innovation to improve operation and to reduce cost. On the next layer, then, you may have adjacencies. Uh, adjacencies can go in two different directions. You can have in an existing market a new business model, or you may have in an existing business model, but you go into new market. The very right corner, that's the call the new or transformative innovation. And that's really when you're going into new markets or customer segments with new business models. That's the hardest. What you can see here in this section is that the degree of uncertainty goes up dramatically. Uh, core, you have a lot of data. You can do net present value at the top right corner. You have to build a lot of around assumptions. But it's important that leadership has a common language, a common understanding when we talk about core innovation, adjacency, or new. That's the basic of everything you can do with leadership Otherwise, you're aligning on something and everybody has a different language. Now, another question now to you, Scott, is really around the business model definition or the business boundaries. 
because if you develop a strategy and it's not clear what the business boundaries are, then you might uh, create a strategy which is really flawed. So how, what is your experience regarding, let's say, the business you're in? Yeah, it's a great question. I think something that organizations, particularly ones that have existed for a long time, they often get wrong and they often forget about because they think that the products that they serve or the services that they offer, those are the things that define what business they're in and what businesses they could be in. The general thing that we guide them to do is to ask the, the classic Innocite slash Clay Christensen, our, our co-founders question, not what is the product you sell, what is the job your customer is trying to get done? And I think one of the most powerful examples of how this question can reframe the way you think about growth comes from the Crest brand within Procter & Gamble. So historically, Crest would look at itself as a brand that provides toothpaste, that's got fluoride that's in a tube. If that is your business, how do you innovate? Well, you might make the tube bigger or smaller. You might increase or decrease the amount of fluoride. You might make the cap a little better. You might change the color, et cetera, et cetera. It's all very incremental stuff. You get into a share game against other competitors. If you ask the question, what is the reason why people use our products? Well, in this case, it's healthy teeth and great smiles for life. All of a sudden, the innovation landscape opens up. And you can think about teeth whitening solutions. You can think about mouthwash. You can think about services and many other things. You then have to make decisions about which of those you're willing to do and which of those you won't do. But you at least have a grounding that opens up the playing field substantially. And I think we all know when you're facing disruptive change in your market, when you've got threats of commoditization, when you've got new people coming in, you need that ability to expand what you're trying to do or else you're just not going to have the necessary avenues for growth. So that's some of the things that we've learned. Okay, so Bernard, before we talk about making that misalignment that you mentioned really come to life, we got to get the last component of the common language. So we talked about the typology, we talked about some of the things that could be the definition and boundaries of the business. What about this growth gap thing? Bring that to life for us, please. Yeah, and that uh, was really at the center of what we did at Swisscom and what we're doing at other clients. It's also well described in our article. Uh, you visualize really what the problem is you're solving for. And again, I'm doodling here a little bit, but normally you have, let's say, a revenues in 2018. And now, you have to define what is my revenues in 2030, for example. And it's important that you're putting that bar far in the future, because if you remember, I talked about core innovation, core innovation, that's, you can realize that maybe in the next two to three years. But if you talk transformative innovation, you're going into new markets with new business models, to be realistic, that might take 10 years, it might take 15 years. But so if you do just a five-year strategic plan, then you're just looking at core and maybe adjacencies, but you cannot look at it in a serious way in terms of transformative uh, innovation. So it's important that you put that aspiration, let's say, at 2030 or even further. But the first question you ask then is the leadership. So how much growth do you want by 2030? And they will not be able to answer that question. It's a very tough question. And it's not a budget question. It's not a five years plan where you say, okay, we have been growing at 5% over the last five years, and we want to continue the next five years also with 5%. It's a fundamentally different question. It's really how aspirational are you as a leadership team? And you have to align on that. Once you're aligned on that, and you can do that with benchmarks, you can look at other com companies, et cetera, and very often people are more ambitious than when they start the dialogue. Uh, once you have that aspiration, then you look and say, okay, how much growth then comes from the core? And there you have to be very realistic also on having assumptions about the core, and it's not a budget discussion, it's not a discussion about uh, uh, let's say bony, et cetera, it's much more what do we really think will happen over the next 20 years, 10 years or whatever in terms of the core. And very often you will have disruption, there will be commoditization, et cetera. And very often this is a little bit less than you might expect. And there might be some growth coming from the core, some might be adjacency, a little bit stuff in the innovation portfolio, but it's certainly not helping you to get to that aspiration. 
So long story short, what happens is then you have, let's say here, a gap to close between what you currently have in the innovation portfolio and as a core business towards that growth aspiration. And what we very often do, Scott, and I think that's very important, we visualize that uh, to the wall. So everybody can see it. And very often we also use red color for the gap because then you see, oh, we cannot just focus on the core business. We should really talk about the future. What do we have to do? Do we have to reinvent ourselves? Uh, do we have to go into new markets? Do we have to go into new business models? So the entire dialogue in the leadership uh, team changes. Uh, you're not lost in these details around the core as you are in the five-year plan. The focus goes much more here around the gap and what you, how you close it. And that's when you need also to think about transformative innovation. Now, Scott, when we do that with our clients, what happens very often is that leadership doesn't feel comfortable to think about a time horizon of 10, 20 years because there's so much uncertainty or they will say, we can't do that because we don't know what will be in 20, 30 years. And indeed, we don't know. So how do you cope with the uncertainty? Uh, I think, Bernard, the biggest thing is you just accept it. So you recognize that you cannot be exactly precisely right about the future. So one of the mantras that we have is that you accept rough answers because you know the answers are going to be rough, they're going to be directional, but you demand precise assumptions. So you're as clear as you can possibly be about what are the assumptions you're making about the future. We know what an assumption is. This is something we take for granted. It's a supposition. We have various ways that we can talk about it. You might call it a guess theory, whatever. But when you're thinking about the future, you need to have what we call strategic assumptions, where they're not vague, they're focused, they're not loose, they're precise, and they're not something that you say will happen at some point. They are very specifically time-bounded. You see some examples of this. These are all stylized, but you see some examples from this on the slide. The first one is from a group I was working with in Singapore. We're working with the HR community for a, a large financial institution, and they were talking about changes to their workforce. And they said, in the future, our workforce will be younger. Okay, when, how much? If you say it will be younger, you can't do anything with that. If you come up with the precise assumption you're making, four or five years in the future, this percent will be younger versus this percent, you now have something that you can measure. You've got something you can monitor. In some cases, you have something that you can experiment around. So accept rough answers, demand precise assumptions, because with precise assumptions, you can begin having real discussions You've got the system that you can use to watch things, and you've got your plan to go and experiment. All right, we have finished the first part of the process where you go and establish the common ground. So we would love to hear from you. We're gonna open up another poll question. We talked about four things. Which of these four do you think will be the biggest gap or most challenging in your organization? Is it this typology coming up with the different types of innovation? The business definition, what job you truly do for your customers? the gap between today and future aspirations, or is it being precise about your future strategic assumptions? So once you go and click on the button, make sure you cast your vote. We, again, Bernard, cannot cast our own individual vote, which makes me sad. We can bias the sample a little bit, but we'll see what you have to say. And we'd love for those of you who are tracking along, if you've got anything else other than things we talked about here that you find particularly challenging, make sure you throw it in the Q&A area and we'll talk about it in just a few minutes when we pause for questions. All right, Kristen, what do the results show? All right, so the strategic assumption thing is what the group bounds hardest. That's interesting. So it is something that we see a lot of people either don't do or they do it with a degree of vagueness that you really can't do something about. So the discipline that we'd like you to go back with is every time you're talking about the future, say what assumptions are you making? What would need to be true? What would you need to believe about a certain thing? And when you start doing it, say by when, how much, and how much is it today? Then you can have, start to have real conversations about the future. Uh, Scott, allow me to, to just uh, comment on that one. I, I'm a little bit surprised. Uh, because when we do innovation audits, we look at companies and look at their innovation system along strategic dimension, 
processes and structures, governance related issues, and also around people. The innovation typology in more than 75% is a key problem. Companies believe they have an innovation typology, but in reality, they don't. And uh, there are differences in, in, in language between regions, between business units, et cetera. So I'm surprised about that outcome. I agree, assumptions are very, very important, but uh, I, I re am really surprised about this low score in innovation typology. You know, I, I and I think an interesting test that our listeners can go and bring back, next leadership team meeting, ask everybody to write down the typology on a piece of paper, then trade it with the person next to you and see if you write, wrote down the same thing. Yeah. Or even more simply, just ask people to define innovation. And, and I bet that you will see that people are all over the map when it comes to it. Wouldn't you agree? I, I fully agree. And I always say that you need an innovation typology in a common language, and you need a very clear language also in accounting. If someone defines EBITDA differently than another person, then we have a problem and you could never do proper financing. And in innovation, transformation is exactly the same thing. You need a language, you need a system, you need a discipline, otherwise you will not be able to have successful transformation. Okay, great. So we talked about the first thing, we've got to establish a common ground. And as I said, as we were going through it, this is something that Innosight has talked about a lot before. As we start getting into the next two parts of the process, this is where things really start to get different. So we said the second step is that we want to bring misalignments to the surface. Bernard, can you say a little bit more about how you did that at Swisscom? Yeah, what normally happens is that uh, people believe they're aligned and uh, you don't really know that they are not mis uh, misaligned and there are several methodologies which you can apply. One, for example, we do very often, we send uh, short surveys to the leadership team before a lead uh, workshop or before a dialogue and ask them, for example, how would you see the uh, compound annual growth rates of the business unit X over the next 15 years? How, what is, for example, the growth aspiration, et cetera, et cetera, especially on the assumptions you ask people what their belief is or also trends. Because we have uncertainty, you will just have a, a good opinion about something like that, but you have to be aligned because otherwise you're not defining the strategy properly. And what these surveys show is unbelievable. There is a huge misalignment uh, normally around these key questions, but you make it visible. And, and sometimes you keep it anonymous so that people don't feel uh, put on the stage, but it's important that you see the misalignment. Another exercise, and that's what we've been doing at Swisscom, is the following. We put two whiteboards um, in the room, and uh, there were the optimist and the pessimist group. And these optimists and pessimists, uh, they were just standing around that whiteboard and uh, they were uh, putting all the different arguments on it, etc. And it's very important when they write down that you see and you have this open dialogue on what is the optimistic view on the future and what is the pessimistic, and you will see that they are not aligned on key questions. But it's not important to be right or wrong. It is important to understand that different views in the leadership team about the future. And then you have to align, and then maybe you have to do additional, let's say, research or talk to experts so that you can, as a leadership team, uh, align on certain of these key assumptions. But it's important that you make it visible. Uh, that's absolutely important. Otherwise, you, you don't even know that you should align because you don't know that you're missing. Good. Another question is, of course, um, when you look at misalignment, I mean, there are differences in different companies, but you work for a professional service company um, in, in um, I can't say where it is, but it was not in Europe. It's somewhere in the world. It's somewhere in the world, and you also had misalignment and professional services firms uh, is, is quite different than, let's say, a Swisscom. Uh, how did you do that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I'm going to describe a really iconic moment when we were working with this organization that really made something very clear in their eyes. So if you look at what's going on in professional services to this optimist pessimist view, it's not hard to make the case for pessimism if you stand still, because you've got all these things coming. You've got artificial intelligence, you've got distributed ledger or blockchain technologies, 
you've got big data analytics and so on that mean for many players in the industry, if they stand still, the disruptors are going to come and get them. So we're working with this organization. We start, as you often do, with the situation analysis. We look at all these disruptive trends. We go and share it with its board of directors. And everybody agrees this is a critical issue. We've got to up our innovation game. We've got to do more. But how much? How much should we start thinking about investing as we go to the future? How critical is it for people? We did something pretty interesting. So we had everybody in the room. So we had a bunch of people who were sitting around the table represented by these bodies here. And we asked them a question. They said, we asked them, of the profit pool next year, this is a privately held company, of the profit pool next year, what percent of the profits do you think should we invest in innovation to demonstrate a commitment to do something different? We had them all take out their mobile phones, which they really liked because they could catch up on Twitter and other sorts of things. And we gave them a poll question. In real time, answer this question. Give us a number. We then, on the screen in front of them, had the numbers come up in real time in word cloud format. So the bigger the number, the more people actually voted for that number. And the output looked something like this. So the really big 10 means that's what most people did. So you look at the output here and you're drawn normally to the average. And you'd say, okay, if we ran all the numbers through a, a, a simple average, the average would be 10, the standard deviation would be two, 10 is the answer. But what struck us as the group wasn't the average, it was the outliers. We had a two in one case, we had a 20 in another. So what we did is we said, all right, who in the room gave a 20? The person revealed themselves. We said, state your case. What is the reason why you gave a 20 in answer to the question? The person here then said, well, I'm assuming this, blah, 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 blah. We then said, okay, who is the person who gave a two? It's the person sitting over here. Why did you give a two? State your case. This wasn't a decision-making meeting, so it was totally safe for them to go and do this. It was incredibly eye-opening for the group because they saw they were really all over the map. But because they then put their assumptions on the table, we knew exactly what we had to go and work on as we were going to go try and drive that group to alignment. It was an incredibly powerful moment for the group. And we have now tried to make sure that this is something that other people can do easily. Lucas, can you go back to the, the PowerPoint presentation for just a second? Lucas is helping with the crack IT support as we go back and forth here. We actually used a Singapore-based company called Pigeonhole Live. It's got great real-time polling capabilities to do the thing that I just described with this professional services company. If you go to the URL here, either type it in or you can scan the QR code, there's a landing page that describes this and related activities and gives you access to a simple free tool that allows you to do something similar. And I think, Bernard, it's safe to say, in both of our experiences, using these kinds of polling tools can be incredibly high impact. They're very easy to implement and they're very, very powerful because it's the visualization, the real-time visualization of misalignment uh, which you can show. And then it becomes obvious that you have a misalignment. It becomes obvious that you have to align uh, on a certain topic. Otherwise, you cannot move forward and really uh, go uh, seriously about transformation. Okay, let's get to the third and most important part. So you know, imagine that professional services company. We, we had surfaced their misalignment. We had shown that they were all over the map. You had ranged from 2 to 20 with an average of 10. you got to get this group to align. And usually the way you do this is you get everyone around a table, you lull them into a low state of hypnosis through a long PowerPoint presentation, and you talk, 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 until it appears you have consensus. This is not what you did at Swisscom, is it? No, that's not what we did at Swisscom. And indeed, if people, leadership, just stay seated in there, uh, let's say around the table, I mean, that's not when, when things will happen and you will get alignment. So you have to get uh, physical I would say. What we did at Swisscom, we put a tape on the floor. The, let's say this tape has a length of less than 15 meters. And we put a certain number of extremes around the growth aspiration. Let's take a, you can grow 5%, you can go grow 10%, 20%, and even maybe be very ambitious and you grow 30%. 
So you have that tape on the floor, and then you ask the people, please state your own belief on how much growth you will have by 2030. And once you've made up your mind, please go and stand on the tape on the floor. So now everybody came from different directions, and they were placing themselves here at the different places. Now, what you can see here is there's a huge misalignment, but the more important thing is that you get alignment in having that person trying to convince that person on the left side to move in this direction. And then that person has to convince this person on the far right to move on the left. Now, suddenly you have arguments uh, regarding uh, this misalignment and why you think they should be at another place and you talk about the assumptions openly and you will learn a lot. But the important thing here is that everybody has to take position. And what we do very often, we place the CEO and the CFO at the very end. Because what we don't want is that the CEO, let's say, takes the position at 10% and then everybody goes in this direction because they want to look good. Normally, the CEO goes at the very end. And what I've seen also is that an organization might be even more ambitious than the CEO, and then the CEO might have changed uh, her or his view and, and take another position. But this being physical in the room and seeing everybody having a position, it's extremely powerful. And you cannot do any finger pointing in 10 years or 20 years. Oh, we were all, you were wrong and I was right. You cannot do that because it might be that the number will be here somewhere, but everybody was here. And everybody will remember the position in that day. And that's very, very powerful because then you take a common responsibility. Yeah, and I think one of the things that, again, is really powerful is that what you described here, this isn't just something that's made up. There's actually good research that shows if you get people kinesthetically involved, if you get them to participate in the discussion, you get them to move around, they'll commit to it more. I remember, Bernard, one time we were having a discussion in our own organization about a strategic direction for your region, Europe, and you had everybody go up to the whiteboard and begin putting little marks on the screen for what they thought was the best option. Getting people involved changed the entire tone of the discussion, and we can visibly see that people wanted to do something that was pretty aggressive. Right, and some people don't want to stand up, and then uh, that's also visible. That means you're not involved and you're not participating the way you should probably participate if you think about the future of the company. Now, let's look at uh, different questions uh, from your side, and uh, maybe... Yes, please type in your questions in the question box. We have an interesting one from Daniel, who's a business person with a background in the performing arts. He's very curious about this methodology of putting people on their feet. And he says, I know you utilize hard science to convince people, but how do you deal with the simple human embarrassment, the resistance of having people engage in these activities in front of their peers? Uh, the first time I did that exercise, I was really worried and I thought that will never ever work, but you would be surprised that most people always uh, they participate because it's too important. But what you can do really, if there is a problem, you can, let's say, talk to the influencer, you, to, you talk to the CEO and up, up front and say, that's what we will do. Please uh, motivate the people to participate. And then they will do it and, and, and will really be very, very active. You can also tell stories. You can say, okay, we did that with the executive team at Swisscom. Um, and then we'll say, oh, they did it. So maybe we should also try doing it. And it's extremely powerful um, if, if you do it. And of course, you can also give them our article and then they can read about it. Uh, but um, I've never seen really a difficult situation uh, with one exception, but that was just before because it was very, very political. But we found a way around that also in that situation. And, and I think, as Bernard said, one of the things you want to do is if you're trying to get a group, <clears throat> excuse me, of 15 to do something, you find somebody, somebody who's going to be the enthusiastic person to be the first one to go to the line and really then make it socially acceptable for other people to do it as well. So you, you go and try to pick your battles as you go to do it. 
we have a question about um, the growth gap chart and how do you explore what those opportunities are to make up what is going to fill the growth gap? Um, is there research and data that's collected before your meeting? The growth gap, if you have the growth gap, it depends how big the growth gap is. But one thing we do normally, um, if you have the growth gap, we call that goals and bounds. Uh, we ask the leadership team, what are things that are desirable and things that are unthinkable and maybe other things that you are willing to discuss? And of course, the bigger the growth gap is, the more the boundaries will be broad in the sense that you have to go new ways, you have to do things maybe differently. You may suddenly change your view on how to use the brand. You may change your geographic scope, et cetera, et cetera. That's one thing to do, but that's again, not huge research. We don't have a lot of information about the future. But what we do very often is then really we identify strategic opportunity areas and strategic opportunity areas, we call that the punts. And in these punts, you wanna fish for ideas, but they give you an area almost as an oil field where you wanna dig for oil. And there you have to do research, but not the standard research. It's not benchmarks because benchmarks, I mean, if you find a company that's already out there, you're already too late. What you have to do is you have to talk to customers and non-customers, that's also important, and really try to identify needs that are not met yet. And we call that jobs to be done. And that's a very important element then to align on where you would like to get. Okay. Um, one more question. Now I'll okay. take one more, Evan, and then we'll close it out. We did have someone say, is this talk sponsored by Pigeonhole? Because we referenced the tool. No, but... we like Pigeonhole, <laughs> but they didn't sponsor it. Uh, <laughs> we do have one question about what are some metrics if you have a, a dual transformation approach of A and B growth areas, what are some of the metrics to test and the scalability and the robustness of these new growth ventures? I think, Scott, you should take this one. You wrote the book about it. Yeah, so. indeed. So you know, the, 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 there isn't a generic metric. The metric is going to be, of course, different for every growth area, for every <laughs> industry. I think the important thing to note is as you're going more towards transformation B, as we called it in the book, more for the things that were towards the right of the two-by-two two that Bernard drew, blue oceans, white spaces, whatever you want to call it, the more the early stage metrics are going to be about learning rather than earning. So this isn't, are you hitting sales targets or profit targets or whatever? It's you made a set of assumptions about what you think could be an attractive area. You then designed the best test that you can to learn about those experiments. You've executed those tests. Now what do you do? What have you learned? What can you think about it? As you begin to get a little bit more granularity about what you're doing, of course the metrics are going to transition from what you're learning to what you're earning. But in the early days, it's really about the pace and efficiency with which you can convert the assumptions you're making into knowledge. And again, it's going to be different in every context, but that's at least the way that we think about it. All right, so let's close out this, this very good webinar by talking about the path forward. So we've been talking about Swisscom a lot. So Bernard, what, what, what happened in this case? So we surfaced the misalignment, we got them to align, and then they did nothing, right? No, I'm kidding. They must have done something. What did they, they do? They did something. and. Uh... I can, of course, I cannot reveal confidential information here, but uh, one thing they did, and I think that's uh, really something I would recommend to any comp every company, is to build a strategic narrative. Once you know where you want to go, how aspirational you want to be, how you close the growth gap, <clears throat> then you have to put that in a strategic narrative. And with that story, with that, you go out then to into the organization, uh, you informed, they informed middle management, they informed also then the entire troop, they talked also to the press, they talked to the board, et cetera. It's very, very important how you do that communication and that's one thing uh, they did. They also adapted their governance system because if you have core, adjacent and new, you need different systems, different processes, different governance systems. And what they did, they had to change or adapt their governance system then for the transformative innovation. And um, you can go into the press and see what they did over the last years, it's pretty impressive. But they really changed dramatically the way how they went about transformative innovation uh, to fuel growth. We call that also dual transformation. 
you reposition the core, and then you create growth engines at the same time. Great, and let me put this in a little bit of context in the, the last couple of slides, and then Bernard will close this out. This is a journey. When you are taking your company, your organization from one state to another, when you are navigating disruptive change, you are going to have to start by making the case for why you should do this. You then have to create that narrative, create that vision for the future that does take a future back perspective. You then have to get ready. You have to do all the things that we talked about here to align the team and actually put resources behind initiatives. You'll have a crisis at this moment. Are you really serious about it? And if you haven't done what we've talked about during this webinar, you'll have stated agreement in a room that will dissipate when stuff gets real. You then have to go and launch these initiatives and build on early success, dealing with crises of conflict as today's business and tomorrow's business inevitably fight over scarce resources. Then you optimize and scale and really go to create the next version of your organization dealing with a very subtle crisis of identity as you're becoming something different and you've got people who don't like that, who aren't comfortable with that. This is a really tough thing to do, which means you have to put in the right infrastructure to support it. You need a very clear blueprint that takes these strategic opportunity areas and gets detailed about the assumptions to be tested and the resources you'll allocate to make it happen. You need to take a next level deep view and create a program it's got work streams and owners, so this isn't something that you just talk about, it's something you actually do, and you need a very strategic plan to communicate this to multiple stakeholders. That's just in the planning phase. As you go and execute, you need to, on an ongoing basis, measure and manage your portfolio, constantly looking to make sure that it is sufficient, that it's optimized, that it's adequate for what you're trying to do. Then you need to make sure that you're providing leaders with decision support. New games have to be played by new rules. If you're making decisions about tomorrow using yesterday's rules and tools, we guarantee you're gonna screw something up. This is an incredibly hard thing to do, but we think the toolkit we've provided here and in the other things that we've done at Innosite give you the best chance of success. So Bernard, why don't you summarize and we can call it a webinar. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Scott. So just to summarize, we talked about four things, and uh, I hope that you can take that with you and then on Monday morning drive transformation. The first one is really establish a common ground. Don't talk about alignment or misalignment before you have established this common ground. We talked about three things. Get the business definition right, because you can have the best strategy, but if you haven't defined the business boundaries, correctly, the strategy will be flawed. Secondly, you need a common language innovation typology, and you need also a clear understanding what the growth or performance gap is, point one. Point two, expose misalignment. We, we showed that different methodologies, e-surveys, um, let's say optimist, pessimist, show that you're misaligned. It's nothing wrong about that. But if once you know that you're misaligned, then you are aware that you have to do something about that. Because if leadership is not aligned, you will not be able to execute successfully a transformative path. Third one is get physical drive alignment. Uh, and don't do that in staying seated in your seat, but get physical, stand up, move in the room, uh, because that will take a fundamentally different dynamic. Give everybody a voice show everybody the position uh, in a certain question. And around all that, that's the fourth point, use strategic assumptions. And Scott, you made it very clear, it should be focused and it should be time bounded. Very important, otherwise assumptions are not precise enough and will lead you in the wrong direction. So these are the four points. I hope you can take them with you home. Evan will now close the webinar. Uh, we thank you very much indeed for having participated. We hope again that on Monday morning your transformation uh, will be going in the right direction and will be successful. Wish you good luck. Thank you, Bernard and Scott. And for more on Unite Your Senior Team, please come to Innosite.com where you could download a complimentary PDF of the Harvard Business Review article. This webinar as well as the presentation slides and doodles have been recorded and will be shared with you following today's event. On behalf of Innosite, we thank you very much for joining us.